All right. Elijah, do you want to start us off today by praying? Yeah. <clears throat> Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, Father, and your, and your love for your people. Lord, I pray that we would set apart this time, Lord, as, uh, as holy and set apart as we bring it before you and spend time together not as earthly friends, but, Lord, as brothers and in, in the midst of your house and your kingdom. So, Lord, I pray that you would bring to us knowledge and wisdom, Lord, not from our, our minds, but Lord, from your Holy Spirit. And bless this time in his name. Amen. 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 Okay. So we're going to try to read chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Spiritual Progress. Chapter 3 is titled, On Pure Love. Well, it's about three paragraphs. The Lord hath made all things for himself. Proverbs 16, verse 4. Says the scripture, Everything belongs to him. And he will never release his right to anything. Free and intelligent creatures are his as much as those which are otherwise. He refers every unintelligent thing totally and absolutely to himself. And he desires that his intelligent creatures should voluntarily make the same disposition of themselves. It is true that he desires our happiness, but that is neither the chief end of his work nor an end to be compared with that of his glory. It's a very important statement there. I might go back to that. It is for his glory only that he wills our happiness. The latter is a subordinate consideration, for he, which he refers to the final and essential end of his glory. That we may enter into his designs in this respect, we must prefer God before ourselves, and endeavor to will our own happiness for his glory. In any other case, we invert the order of things. We must not desire his glory on account of our own salvation. But on the other hand, the desire for his glory should impel us to seek our own happiness as a thing which he has been pleased to make a part of his glory. It is true that all holy souls are not capable of exercising this explicit explicit preference for God over themselves, but there must at least be an implicit preference. The former, which is more perfect, is reserved for those whom God has endowed with light and strength to prefer him to prefer him to themselves, to such a degree as to desire their own happiness simply because it adds to his glory. <clears throat> Men have a great repugnance to this truth and consider it to be a very hard saying, because they are lovers of self, from self-interest. They understand, in a general and superficial way, that they must love God more than all his creatures, but they have no conception of loving God more than themselves, and loving themselves only for him. They can utter these great words without difficulty, because they do not enter into their meaning, but they shudder when it is explained to them that God and his glory are to be preferred before ourselves and everything else to such a degree that we must love his glory more than our own happiness and must refer the latter to the former as a subordinate means to an end. Share with me some of your thoughts. What does he mean by that? Those last few things that he says, uh, that we must love his glory more than our own happiness and must refer the latter to the former as a subordinate means to an end. So our own happiness yeah. is the latter mm -hmm. and his glory is the former. So we must refer to the hap our happiness to the former, which is his glory, which means that it's not our happiness that's the standard. Our happiness that is the the plumb line of what we measure to be of value and of worth in this life. It's mm -hmm. his glory. Mm -hmm. 
And so when he says, as a subordinate means to an end, he's talking about happiness. Happiness is not the end. That's a very sharp statement to people that think that life is all about experiencing in the end and in the fullest way possible um, soulish contentment and happiness. Life is not about being happy. Happiness is to exist at all, which obviously it does. <laughs> Thank goodness, because happiness can be a very good thing. It it only is a good thing when it serves as a means to an end, and not as the end. Yeah. So that's what it means to refer to God's glory when mm-hmm. ever considering the idea of happiness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure, share more about what you guys think. I marked down a sentence where it says, um, they understand in a general superficial way that they must love God more than all his creatures, but they have no conception of loving God more than themselves, and loving themselves only for him. Which is <coughs> interesting to look at man's capacity to understand what love is or understand how they can love is as far as they think they've understood it it's more just all about kind of like a selfish love Mm -hmm. like a self gratifying way of loving because even like being selfless in a way can sometimes just be some kind of way of putting yourself on a pedestal or something at some point. It's the only like, real way to lay down yourself in love is to understand almost how God loves and how um, understanding that love isn't a, a, a feeling or something that can be understand and understood in an earthly way. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah make an interesting point about how selflessness or coming across as a um, a servant to others perhaps can be disingenuous. It can be insincere. And so in that sense, it's actually a, a guise of selflessness. It's feigned selflessness, so it's not even real selflessness, which is nonetheless can be and often is very deceiving to those who uh, perceive things in a worldly way. And that's something that if we have the, the wisdom and insight to do so can perceive in other people who carry that that insincere way of of uh, being a servant to other people but doing it to gratify their own ends but even more than that and this can actually be a much more painful and disappointing process but we even detect that in ourselves at times or maybe at first when we're we're not looking uh, deep enough into our motives or our character what spirit is really driving our behavior we act in a way that seems selfless and even loving to other people but it's not necessarily based on an enlightened selflessness or a godly love and so it actually is it's not true selflessness and it's not true love. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like uh, just this little portion is not talking specific or on 
love as a general thing, mm -hmm. but more as like a a love for the Father specifically, like how we are to to love Him, and that's mm -hmm. interesting because you know in the Scripture it talks about obviously God being love, so the very yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of <coughs> overlap in that uh, in that word love, but I I also marked a little section where it says he desires that his intelligent creatures should voluntarily make the same disposition of themselves. Mm -hmm. Talking about uh, maybe I should read the, the first half. He refers every unintelligent thing totally and absolutely to himself, and then. Yep. The second part. I thought it was interesting. And we also kind of mentioned this last discussion, I think, but just how uh, a lot of the times in modern beliefs, people will kind of just assume that uh, God will, will take care of them in, like, every way so they don't really have to play a part. They just have to kind of to follow what they know, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that the Lord has actually created us so purposefully to be able to to observe that and actively make that decision to to you know to show ourselves in that way and to live in that way mm -hmm. but it comes with a yeah like an active uh, sharpness of mind I guess mm -hmm. you could say just like wanting to uh to really process the things of the Lord in a living way rather than just something of exactly, the past. Yeah. So that was interesting. I do really love that statement, actually, because yeah. it's almost like he's he's winking a little bit at, at people that, that want to approach things in, or have the tendency to approach things in that intelligent and high-minded way mm. because he said he's basically saying well it'd be better if before God you were more like things that don't even have a mind and submit to his will yeah. by nature why do you have to be intelligent with God Isaac and I were kind of talking about that a little bit ourselves when we had, we were reflecting on that tendency to, to overthink things especially things that are, that are taking place in ourselves. <clears throat> there's, there's a beauty in coming before God in simplicity and in, in truth, which is to say, in spirit, in, in that spiritual purity. So that, that's, he desires that his intelligent creatures, those, as he says afterwards, that voluntarily or by will mm. Give up make the same disposition of, disposition of themselves mm. that being totally and absolutely his mm. obviously he gave us that capacity to make decisions and do so with a consciousness and with an intelligence for a particular reason those are things that we've discussed many times in other sessions about how free will gives us the ability to 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 love and that's what makes relationship possible mm -hmm. these things we've talked about but yeah. at the same time the disposition is not one of us coming before God with everything that we think we are mm -hmm. in an intellectual way but having the same disposition as uh <laughs> It sounds silly to say, but with the same natural um, ownership of God, as like a stone or a tree would have, in the sense that <laughs> we realize how we, and it's again it's 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 part of the human capacity to realize in the first place but that we are created by God and that we belong to him and that we don't belong to ourselves and 
we don't have the only say in the the way that we in fact we don't really have any say in the way that we were designed and uh, we don't have the only say in that process of transformation which takes place in our lives even though we do have part of a a part to play in that based off the decisions we we make in that process but again the beauty of that statement is we make the choice to have the same disposition towards God as the unintelligent parts of creation do of course you shouldn't take that statement all too far because there is something obviously very unique and ordained by God about man that enables him to be having been made in his image be conformed into his likeness but the real purpose of the statement here is to to humble the reader mm -hmm. from this assumption that simply because you are intelligent means that you have some claim over your own life. Isaac, do you have anything more to add before we get started on the next chapter? I think the, I mean, the title of the chapter in itself, Pure Love, Mm -hmm. I, think the, I think that when most people think that they, they love God and you know they're ready to give it all to God we really have no concept of what that looks like because any love that we have for God is not pure it's, we always have our own selfish motives speckled in there mm -hmm. uh, and it sometimes even gets to the point where we We've convinced ourselves that our love for God is pure and without a blemish. Uh, but in reality, that there really is always some self in there or some unpure motive. Uh, and that's, I think that is what overcoming self is. Is if you have not yet overcome the love for yourself, you cannot love God wholeheartedly and purely without sprinkling in your own motives or your own ideas of what loving him looks like. Uh, and so I think God kind of has to bring you to this place of where you don't even really have any other motive or any love for yourself or your own way. Almost this point of desperation where you're just kind of laying yourself bare Mm -hmm. where you're you know you've completely put your will down and you've overcome that love for yourself uh, and I think that that is in essence what pure love is which is why this the, the title of the chapter is I don't know just kind of inspired that line of thinking just mm -hmm. on what pure love is because he has that for us it's unconditional you know, we don't have to do anything for him to love us. But we're we're quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's every day humbling yourself before God and really trying your best and really attempting to have that pure, unblemished love for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the way the author is obviously expressing love in this chapter is a, a dichotomy between the impure, if you will, love of ourselves, which is a preference, as he puts in the second paragraph, for ourselves, and a pure love, which is for God, which is a preference, if you will. Uh, for him which ties into this interesting concept he brings up of the uh, he says the holy souls it's true that all holy souls are not capable of exercising this explicit preference for God over themselves 
so outwardly manifested um, preference for God over anything that has to do with themselves and their wants and their desires along the lines of what you were saying. But there must at least be an implicit preference. So something that he's saying at the very least there should be a an inward I mean in both cases it is inward and genuine both in the explicit and the implicit but even though your life may not outwardly manifest this this preference for God there at least must be a a, a change of heart and a a heart that is really after the the things of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord over yourself your priorities are put in line are in the right place mm-hmm. um and honestly, I think if your heart remains in a place of pure love for God, mm-hmm. then that explicit preference, as he puts it, is inevitable. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can remain. I honestly don't think you can remain in a state of implicit preference. Mm-hmm. But he says that you should at least be in that place, even if it's where you're starting. Yeah. If it's where you're at now. Mm-hmm. Anyways, let's go ahead and continue on to the next chapter pages here this is chapter 4 on prayer and the principal exercises of piety it makes a list of enumerated points which uh, I'm going to I'm going to leave it up to you guys to pause on one if there's a thought that you want to share or if there's a thought that I want to share about one I will do that too but you can interrupt me as we go through Number one, true prayer is only another name for the love of God. Its excellence does not consist in the multitude of our words. For our Father knoweth what things we have need of before we ask Him. The true prayer is that of the heart. And the heart prays only for what it desires. To pray, then, is to desire but to desire what God would have us desire. He who asks what he does not from the bottom of his heart desire is mistaken in thinking that he prays. Let him spend days in reciting prayers, in meditation, or in inciting himself to pious exercises. He prays not once, truly, if he really desire not the things. If he really desire not, the things he pretends to ask. Two. Oh, how few there are who pray. For how few are they who desire what is truly good. Crosses, external and internal humiliation, renouncement of our own wills, the death of self and the establishment of God's throne upon the ruins of self-love, These are indeed good. I like how he puts that. The establishment of God's throne upon the ruins of (laughs) self-love. That's very dramatic and poetic. Not to desire these is not to pray. To desire them seriously, soberly, constantly, and with reference to all the details of life, this is true prayer. Not to desire him, and yet to suppose we pray... There's an illusion like that of the wretched, the wretched who dream themselves happy. Alas, how many souls full of self and of an imaginary desire for perfection in the midst of hosts of voluntary imperfections have never yet uttered this true prayer of the heart. I mean, just think about how many Christians in this light have never, ever really prayed in my life. I really like how sharp he is in his writing. It's, yeah. yeah, I mean, just think about the way we used to pray and sometimes even have mm-hmm. the tendency to pray. Mm-hmm. About, you know, it's usually, Lord, please do this and that for me and this and this and that and that. Please let us have a... I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to demean mm-hmm. younger people who still pray like, like this because mm-hmm. their hearts have it perhaps reach that full capacity to appreciate deeper things and, you know, uh, more profound considerations of life. But it's 
it's often a matter of, Lord, I pray that we'll have a good day and that we'll have a great time with friends. Like, that's the prayer of a child. But grown and supposedly mature people, Christians, will really pray the same things, but with different words, words that sound a little more sophisticated and spiritual or pious. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a disappointing thing. But the baseline of a, a true prayer is a prayer that denies, not even just denies self, but desires the Lord, the throne of God, to establish itself in Basically. our lives, in our midst, mm -hmm. in our people. Mm -hmm. Like the last point said, it has to be a true desire. Yep. Something from the heart. In fact, I, I want to be able to live that way and speak that way in everything that I do mm -hmm. certainly in prayer and maybe in fact above all in prayer but I want to I want to have a sincere heart in everything I do too I think it talks about that later it's oh cool I'll continue reading then. it is in reference to this that St. Augustine says he that loveth little prayeth little he that loveth much prayeth much three on the other hand, that heart in which the true love of God and true desire exist never ceases to pray. Love, hid in the bottom of the soul, prays without ceasing, even when the mind is drawn another way. So it is possible to pray, even though our minds are in a different place. God continually beholds the desire which he has himself implanted in the soul though it may at times be unconscious of his existence. His heart is touched by it. It ceaselessly attracts his mercies. It is that spirit which, according to St. Paul, helpeth our infirmities and maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's Romans 8, verse 26. Four. Love, desires of God that he would give us what we need and that we, he would have less regard to our frailty than to the purity of our intentions. Intention, again, always having to do with the heart. It even covers over our trifling defects and purifies us like a consuming fire. He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8.27 For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, what we should pray for as we ought. And in our ignorance, frequently request what would be injurious. We should like, we should like fervor of devotion, distinct sensible joys and apparent perfections, which would serve to nourish within us the life of self and a confidence in our own strength. But love leads us on, abandons us to all the operations of grace, puts us entirely at the disposal of God's will, and thus prepares us for all his secret designs. Five. Then we will all things, and yet nothing. What God gives is precisely what we should have desired to ask. For we will whatever he wills, and only that. Thus, this state contains all prayer. It is a work of the heart which includes all desire. The Spirit prays within us for those very things which the Spirit himself wills to give us. Even when we are occupied with outward things, and our thoughts drawn off by the providential engagements of our position, we still carry within us a constantly, cons a constantly burning fire which not only cannot be extinguished but nourishes a secret prayer and is like a lamp continually lighted before the throne of God. I sleep, but my heart waketh. Song of Solomon, verse 2. 
Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. I thought that was Luke 12, 37. separate from mm. because we're not at that point we're not separating our life from God time and then our time you know at that point we're just we're living our lives unto God in the fullest way because we're continually praying and being humble and also before God and also burning we don't just burn sometimes it's like a continual burn um, for the Lord. Um, yeah, I think that's just, it's pretty difficult to learn how to do that constantly. Because we like to kind of go off track a little bit with our earthly mentality, uh, carnal nature. But I think that's something that all of us are really kind of going for. Especially in this time of our lives, it's better to know how to do that and stay there early in life and have that fire and us continually to burn and to, to pray. Yeah. To reach that state in which we will everything that He wills is to have truly become a matured and established son. A matured and established son. Mm -hmm. And that is the destiny, I think, for every maturing son. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of the saying, I don't, I, I don't remember the saying in its entirety, but from Confucius, Emmanuel will share this one periodically, but it ends in uh, Confucius is giving a list of the things that he learned at different stages of life. I think he says at one point, at 50 I knew my destiny. But at 70 I could follow my heart without crossing the line. Which I think can be Achieved before you're 50. Well, I, I mean to say, I think that can be, be changed to say it's retaining the same essence of the meaning that he, he really became, that's, he became, that is what it's like to become a mature son, is when life is not a, any longer a, uh, a an internal conflict of um, a battle in the, the conscience of whether or not I'm doing the right thing and whether or not my heart is leading me astray or is wayward but that you eventually come to a place where your heart and your spirit and your very will are in line with that of the Father and that is not merely attaining unto a state of personal blessedness or bliss like a spiritual bliss but that's that's why it's so crucial to put that in the context of sonship because in such a state you do truly represent the father because your will is his will or his will is your will let's keep going here six there are two principal points of attention necessary for the preservation of this constant spirit of prayer which unites us with God. We must continually seek to cherish it and we must avoid everything that tends to make us lose it. In order to cherish it, we should pursue a regulated course of reading. We must have appointed seasons of secret prayer 
and frequent states of recollection during the day. Some pretty practical things. We should make use of retirement when we feel the need of it, or when it is advised by those of greater experience and unite in the ordinances appropriate to our condition. I look at someone like Emmanuel specifically in his example, how I was even talking to you Isaac earlier about how sometimes, especially recently, he's been canceling our meetings in the morning. Emmanuel doesn't hesitate when the Spirit moves him to to cancel uh, meetings or even parts of his day or his entire day. He will very often just say, I'm taking this entire day off because I need to spend time before the Lord. To get into that habit of, of knowing when the Lord's moving you to to have a day of rest and sometimes even a day of fasting. So we're, we're actually... Not even just fasting from food, but from activity as well. The Lord does do that. And on the other side too, we can discipline ourselves. And even if we do not feel the particular unction of the Lord, there's sometimes there's still a, a, a need. If you feel that need in the spirit to to receive from the Lord then what's keeping you really from acting on it what what was more important about what you have going on that day yeah, yeah. Mm. and to, to seek seek the Lord mm. we should we should greatly fear and be exceedingly cautious to avoid all things that have a tendency to make us lose the state of prayer Thus, we should decline those worldly occupations and associates which dissipate the mind, pleasures which excite the passions, and everything calculated to awaken the love of the world and those old inclinations that have caused us so much trouble. So that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. there, is an in, there is an infinity of detail in these two heads. General directions only can be given because each individual case presents features peculiar to itself. I think that this is, this part is the one that just really stuck out to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I think that this is what the Lord is really honing on, and at least in kind of where He has me in life. Uh, and that's a really good way to put it, is just being in this constant state of prayer. It's being in the mode, or I guess being in the flow, is what we've called it before. Uh, and this, yeah, I don't know, it's just been really pressed upon me by even my conversation with the Lacasses, mm -hmm. uh, like what I was talking about with you know, of kind of our natural flow in which, you know, the way that we want or desire to live life or even our day, and the flow of the Spirit which is kind of a whole different way of living that day. Uh, but part five and six here just okay. put it really, really well. Uh, you know, to, to, to really question the things that you're consuming. Uh, and even like when, I, when it said like partake in things that diminish the mind, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think of most media... Yeah. Uh, that really, or I think I said dissipate. Sorry. Dissipate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, dissipate. It, it really puts you in this kind of state of just, it kind of lulls you into this almost just complacent, nonchalant state where your your mind isn't really active. You know, it kind of throws you off of that course and kind of takes you out of that place of kind of that. That, pr that state of prayer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it says, you know, how do we keep it? We cherish it, you know? And so it's thinking, what can I do right now in my day to cherish that state of prayer, mm -hmm. to nourish it, you know, to keep that fire lit? You know, if you just put fire in the wood and leave it overnight, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's probably going to go out. Yeah. Uh, 
and not only that, but I think we parti par participate in a lot of things daily that pour water on that fire uh, and that actually put it out uh, or suffocate it rather than feeding it and cherishing it. Uh, but it is really appealing to us, you know, the, those things that put out the fire. That's, that is what we want. That is our own way. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. This is just definitely something that I even think Tim was talking about on Tuesday uh, with just like, <coughs> I even think it, it's in relation to frequencies. I know you and Tim were talking about that. He, even, he mentioned it. There are particular things that we can partake in and certain frequencies that take us out of that state of prayer or fight mm -hmm. against that state of prayer. And there are also frequencies that like worship or just, you know, or just praying in general that feed and nourish that and keep that going and keep you in that flow. Uh, yeah, and so I'm kind of having trouble explaining it, but I think you kind of understand. Oh, you're, you're just fine, yeah. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the time trying to stay in that flow means giving giving up a lot of the things that we want to do. Uh, and as unfortunate as that is, and as, as bad as it feels, that's what we're giving to God. We're, we're laying before Him the idols in our life that take us out of that flow. And even it says, you know, towards the end of six, you know, that excite that that desire to go back to the things of the world and to participate in the things of the world, mm -hmm. that takes us out of that flow, you know? But it feels good in the moment. And even back to Tim's talk, like thinking in the thinking in the future how how it's going to affect you, <coughs> or even how it's going to affect us as a people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the flesh very much wants us to think in the moment. You know, what we want right now, what we feel like right now, uh, what's going to excite us right now. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of just encouraging you to look beyond that. That's good. He actually, I, I don't think he actually hops, hops onto a different subject quite yet, but actually goes into a little bit what he mentioned in the I guess in the first part of the second paragraph of that point six, in, in terms of a regulated course of reading, because in point seven here he says, we should choose those works for reading which instruct us in our duty, in our faults, which while they point out the greatness of God, teach us what is our duty to him and how very far we are from performing it. Not those barren productions which melt and sentimentalize the heart. The tree must bear fruit. We can only judge of the life of the root by its fecundity or its fruitfulness. Eight. The first effect of a sincere love is an earnest desire to know all that we ought to do to gratify the object of our affection. Any other desire is a proof that we love ourselves under a pretense of loving God, that we are seeking an empty and deceitful consolation in Him, that we would use God as an instrument for our pleasure instead of sacrificing that for His glory. God forbid that His children should so love Him, Cost what it may, we must both know and do without reservation what he requires of us. Nine. Seasons of secret prayer must be regulated by the leisure, the disposition, the condition, and the inward impulse of each individual. Meditation is not prayer, but it is its necessary foundation. It brings to mind the truths which God has revealed. We should be conversant not only with 
all the mysteries of Jesus Christ and the truths of his gospel, but also with everything they ought to operate in us for our regeneration. We should be colored and penetrated by them as wool is by the dye. I'm reminded of that metaphor that Emmanuel has used recently of there is certainly the need to to inhale, to breathe in, which is kind of what he's describing meditation to be. Mm-hmm. But there's also that, that, that need to release and to exhale mm-hmm. that which has been received and processed and and drawn from something that one has in a sense become one with mm-hmm. because it's reached a place deeper than the mind but then it comes out again it's like that process of breathing mm-hmm. and that, that exhaling is at least in the way I'm applying the metaphor here is that prayer that comes as a result of meditation mm-hmm. receiving from the Lord Ten. So familiar should they become to us that in consequence of seeing them at all times and ever near to us, we may acquire at the habit of forming no judgment except in their light. That they may be to us our only guide in matters of practice as the rays of the sun are our only light in matters of perception. When these truths are once, as it were, incorporated in us, then it is that our then then it is that our praying begins to be real and fruitful. Up to that point, it was but the shadow. We thought we had penetrated to the most to the inmost recesses of the gospel, when we had barely set foot upon the vestibule. All our most tender and lively feelings, all our firmest resolutions, all our clearest and farthest views about the rough and shapeless mass from which God would hew us into his likeness. Eleven. When his celestial rays begin to shine within us, then we see in the true light then there is no truth to which we do not instantaneously assent, as we admit, without any process of reasoning, the splendor of the sun, the moment we behold his rising beams. Let me try that again. When his celestial rays begin to shine within us, then we see in the true light, then there is no truth to which we do not instantaneously assent as we admit without any process of reasoning the splendor of the sun the moment we behold its rising beams. Our union with God must be the result of our faithfulness in doing and suffering all His will. That's important too. That last sentence kind of a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Explain more. I think it's something Emmanuel talked about a little bit last seven series meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, what we have to offer up to God to be, to be a son, you know, to really mm-hmm. follow Him in a true way and have to give up a little bit of ourselves not a little bit, a lot of it. Which all of us give it all up to God. Not just us, but everything that concerns us. Mm. So the Lord, um, living sacrifice. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing that's interesting as part of what this is saying is the way that his light brings revelation of spiritual truth and not the reasoning intellect. So I, I don't think this is uh, directly, maybe even implicitly what it's, it's saying, but it reminds me of what brings to mind the idea of when we receive revelation from God, 
it's not something that we we take a self-centered pride in having as if as if we were the ones to have formulated that revelation or come up with it as if it was like a, a brainchild of our own our own intellect or genius but that when we we receive a a spiritual truth or an ex- expanding an expanded understanding of a spiritual truth or reality then we realize it is a thing that had been revealed to us mm-hmm. not sourced from us mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just as his, it is his light or as it's put here the, the rising beams of the splendor of this sun of his revealing light that, that brings to light this, this revelation in our hearts and in our spirits Number 12. Our meditations should become every day deeper and more interior. I say deeper because by frequent and humble meditation upon God's truth, we penetrate farther and farther in search of new treasures and more interior because as we sink more and more to enter into these truths, they also descend to penetrate the very substance of our souls. Then it is that a simple word goes farther than whole sermons. It's actually something good. I think that is a, a very important and also just interesting uh, concept. Mm-hmm. I just think it's because it's and especially then is that a simple word goes further than a whole sermon, you know. And I think that that is kind of in relation to when you're when you're in that flow and when God has you in a certain season of life and what He's revealing to you and just how your revelation and understanding is. I think that we can like even in the past we've all kind of shared how. We can read the exact same verses in the Bible and they can mean something completely different dependent on yep. where you are and where the Lord has you. Uh, and it just kind of shows you just a little bit of His power, you know. And even we see in the community all the time, and I see with my mom all the time, stuff that is completely normal to me and I don't see anything in it. It yep. brings her to tears just because of something so simple, even a simple word. Even, you know, a lot of, just anything, you know, it just means so much, more than a thousand sermons. Mm. I don't know, it's just a very uh, beautiful and powerful, uh, and I think highlights just some of the, the amazing parts of being in the flow. I also like how it says... Our meditation should become every day deeper and more interior. Because I think that is in part what kind of that ramping up of intensity looks like. You know, as you've said in the past, Noah, just like that the fire that just keeps getting hotter, you know. Mm-hmm. It becomes more real to us. More personal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I highlight that whole section. Well, um, I think it almost adds to what we were reading in 5 as well, where it's talking about um, when, when we are fully occupied with outward things, but our, thro- our thoughts are, must be drawn into this kind of secret place of meditation and, you know, back to the real foundation our uh, our hearts must be set in a place of stability um, and I just I like the picture like you were talking about of uh, each day that we practice these kind of uh, things meditating and 
uh, really keeping those things, you know, close to our hearts and in our minds, you know, at all times. Kind of reminds me of Noah, what Noah was talking about, just with how certain things of this nature, like once you begin to practice the things of God and begin to live them out, there's almost like the, the natural or um, the way the way of the soul, I guess, is kind of almost replaced, as we can see, like, mm-hmm. what I'm saying about here, like, there's no, it can't operate in the same way, because the, just the very practice of, um, of living these, these kind of things out will eventually take the place of whatever was there before, you know, mm. I don't know, I, I really liked it, though, this whole chapter almost, uh, was bent or kind of like all I was just reminded of this this passage the whole time and just mm-hmm. thinking of how to keep that lamp lit as it talks about in five mm-hmm. near the throne of God and just you know in that constant place that we were talking about uh, just a beautiful a beautiful thing to think about and to to center yourself in, I guess you could say. Hmm. Yeah, I can relate strongly to what both of you have said. On the one end, that feeling um, almost being sometimes at a loss when you see how others can be so strongly impacted or affected by something seemingly so simple you don't see obviously whatever it is the same way that they do you don't mm-hmm. recognize its value um, in the same way that they are able to obviously those things can be personally determined whether it be through experience or what have you but it is I think certainly something that is a a trait of people who do spend a significant amount of time and energy in that that real meditation and, if you will, digestion of uh, spiritual truth, something that maybe doesn't have to comprise an entire sermon, but can be just this this simple concept that weighs on you or on the person in question for for a day or for days or for weeks even or longer than that. They can't get rid of it. And when it comes up in a conversation or in some random occurrence in a, a random day, then it may have a a significant impact on on them and leaving everyone else feeling bewildered but what that really makes me do is not make me feel merely <coughs> bewildered by their reaction but I, I I kind of like along the lines of what Benji was saying it makes me really want to grow in this area of life in this area of reflection learning to really meditate on the fundamental things and to take joy and to find even a a spiritual nourishment in the essentials if you will that's that's a that's a that's also a really good way to to stay to maintain a simplicity of of mind and of life not always feeling like you are insufficient or inadequate because you're always thinking about simple truth and you feel maybe from the pressure of others and the way that they can they express themselves that you would be better suited to pursue more complex or quote unquote deeper thoughts I think the real 
solutions to rely on the Lord to to inform that time of meditation and to lead you in it. Yeah. Okay, I'll keep reading here. Thirteen. The very things which had been fruitlessly and coldly heard a hundred times before now nourish the soul with a hidden manna, kind of like you were saying with Scripture. Having an infinite variety of flavors for days in succession. Let us beware, too, of ceasing to meditate upon truths which have heretofore been blessed to us, so long as there remains any nourishment in them, so long as they yet yield us anything. For it is a certain sign that we will still need we still need their ministration. We derive instruction from them without receiving any precise or distinct impression. There is an indescribable something in them which helps us more than all our reasonings. We behold a truth, we love it, and repose upon it. It strengthens the soul and detaches us from ourselves. Let us dwell upon it in peace as long as possible. Seems like that kind of discernment requires not a, a practical and common sense, oh, well, I've read this dozens of times. Why, why would it be of any relevance to me? Rely less on that way of perceiving things and more on a spiritual intuition mm-hmm. of, I can't really quite tell what it is about this, but, I mean, intuition is a kind of feeling. I, I feel like there's something here. <laughs> that I could, I could draw from. And having that sensitivity to that feeling and patience to wait upon the Lord for Him to reveal that to you, that's, that's a skill in life. Mm-hmm. And no, it's not just about a Bible verse. It's something I've read several times. I, that's just an example. It's, it has to do with interactions with people, thoughts that float by in our mind, something we've heard another said. It has to do with with many things that spiritual intuition needs to be practiced yeah I thought it was interesting this one too just that the whole kind of middle section where it talks about yeah let us beware too of ceasing to med- to meditate upon truths which have therefore been blessed to us mm-hmm. so long as there remains any nourishment in them so long as they yield they yet yield us anything. Mm-hmm. So just kind of um, seeking the Lord and why um, they're even being meditated upon or like why they uh, are in your mind because very much so that they have purpose, you know, and that the Lord wants to to reveal something even through what He has revealed. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think it's just something that I want to practice for sure um, in... in treating those things as not just something in my mind, but something that the Lord has, has placed for a reason. Hmm. It uh, touches on a, a really intriguing thing to me hmm. about learning in life, too. Because it touches on the, rea- the, like the, the reality of of the manifold wisdom of God mm. and the way that it teaches us yeah. of how you can learn an infinity of things mm. from one simple thing I'm reminded of we went over in the introduction during our analects time but how Confucius was praising his best student Yan Hui how and he was talking with another disciple of his how Yan Hui was just so much more intelligent than all of them all of them because Confucius said that when he when this student learns one thing he learns ten things or something like that mm-hmm. and so they were praising that student and Confucius was saying oh actually it was it was Confucius' disciple that was saying that about Yin Hui and then deci- uh, Confucius was like yeah he's smarter than both of us it's because he had really he had really uh, trained his mind to perceive reality and knowledge 
and exercise uh, understanding in 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 a such an enlightened and expansive in deep both deep and lofty way it's it's really it's a really cool subject to me mm-hmm. I think obviously it best applies in the learning and meditation of spiritual truth but it can even go beyond into the way you learn other things mm-hmm. touch on that a little bit I know. and the next time we were talking about how to learn mm-hmm. we'll call that all right where was I? 14. 14. As to the manner of meditating, it should not be subtle nor composed of long reasonings. Here we go. Simple and natural reflections derived immediately from the subject of our thoughts are all that is required. We need take a few truths, meditate upon these without hurry, without effort, and without seeking for far-fetched reflections. Every truth should be considered with reference to its practical bearing. To receive it without employing all means to put it faithfully in practice, at whatever cost, is to desire to hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1, verse 18. It is a resistance to the truth impressed upon us, and of course to the Holy Spirit. This is the most terrible of all unfaithfulness. Reminds me again of, <laughs> I guess my mind's in the, the analects time, but mm-hmm. the difference between studying and learning, you guys remember that. It's, a dif- it's the difference between it being a, a mere survey of information or in the context of uh, meditation, a, a mere string of reasonings or train of reasonings to be something that we consider in light of putting it into practice or with a a consciousness of realizing that we are receiving perhaps very lofty and um, meaningful spiritual truth but only so uh under the condition that it's it's something that we want to see bear fruit in our lives through putting it into practice. Not something that we just consider as a beautiful truth. Mm-hmm. It's beyond beautiful truths. In fact, so this, it's a, an offense to the Holy Spirit when we consider it in any other light. That's, that's to, <clears throat> to fall into the, the shortcoming of intelligence or piousness. It's beyond contemplation is the point. So 15. As to a method in prayer, each one must be guided by his own experience. Those who find themselves profited in using a strict method need not depart from it. While those who cannot so confine (coughs) confine themselves... (coughs) may make use of their own mode without ceasing to respect that which has been useful to many and which so many pious and experienced persons have highly recommended. A method is intended to assist. If it be found to embarrass instead of assisting, the sooner is discarded, the better. That's the real message there is don't get too tied up in the way you pray. Because then that distracts from the real heart behind prayer. Mm -hmm. The form rather than the essence. Yeah. So he's going to give us some more practical advice here. 16. The most natural mode at first is to take a book and to cease reading whenever we feel so inclined by the passage upon which we are engaged. And whenever that no longer ministers to our interior nourishment to begin again. As a general rule, those truths which we highly relish and which shed a degree of practical light upon the things which we are required to give up for God are leadings of divine grace, which we should follow without hesitation. 
The Spirit bloweth where it listeth. John 3, 8. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Like in Corinthians 3, 17. In the course of time, the proportion of reflections and reasonings will diminish. And that of tender feelings, affecting views and desires, will increase as we become sufficiently instructed and convinced by the Holy Spirit. The heart is satisfied, nourished, warmed, set on fire. A word only will give it employment for a long time. I like how he describes the, the movement that this, this way of receiving truth, even through reading, goes from the mind to the heart. But she describes as it going beyond, or the, the way of receiving it in a, a mode of reflection and reasoning will gradually diminish, and at least and it becomes something that we contemplate in heart and in spirit. As he says here, through tender feelings, affecting views, so heart posture and mindsets and perspectives of life, and desires, or content of the heart that way of receiving it will increase as we become sufficiently instructed and convinced by the Holy Spirit. So it becomes something that not merely affects, not merely informs what we think about, but affects the way that we think. Seventeen. Finally, increase of prayer is indicated by an increase of simplicity and steadiness in our views. A great multitude of objects and considerations being no longer necessary. Our intercourse with God resembles that with a friend. At first, there are a thousand things to be told and as many to be asked. But after a time, these diminish while the pleasure of being together does not. Everything has been said, but the satisfaction of seeing each other, of feeling that one is near the other, or reposing in the enjoyment of a pure and sweet friendship, can be felt without conversation. The silence is eloquent and mutually understood. Each feels that the other is in perfect sympathy with him, and that their two hearts are incessantly poured one into the other, and constitute but one. 18. Thus it is that in prayer our communion with God becomes a simple and familiar union far beyond the need of words. But let it be remembered that God himself must alone institute this prayer within us. Nothing would be more rash nor more dangerous than to dare to attempt it of ourselves. We must suffer ourselves to be led step by step by some one con, by someone conversant with the ways of God who may lay the immovable foundations of correct teaching and of the complete death of self in everything 19 as regards retirement and attending upon ordinances we must be governed by the advice of someone in whom we have confidence our own necessities, the effect produced upon us in many other circumstances, are to be taken into consideration. 20. Our leisure and our needs must regulate our retirements. Our needs because it is with the soul as with the body. When we can no longer work without nourishment, we must take it. We shall otherwise be in danger of fainting. Our leisure, because this absolute necessity of food accepted, we must attend to duty before we seek enjoyment in spiritual exercises. The man who has public duties and spends the time appropriate to them in meditating in retirement would miss of God while he was seeking to be united to him. True union with God 
is to do his will without ceasing. In spite of our all natural in spite of all our natural disinclination in every duty of life, however disagreeable or mortifying. So the time that we spend with God is not to be done in an excuse to avoid life responsibilities. Because responsibilities in life are given by God. And so by seeking to to be to spend time with him and, and separate yourself to to hear from him, if that's not something that the Lord uh, led you to do, or if it's something that you were in in the in the same way uh, doing in order to avoid other things that you need to do then you're actually not necessarily drawing close to the Lord because it's if you have if you have a sensitive conscience in the first place it's not even something you can engage in with a pure conscience mm-hmm. which inhibits you at the very beginning yeah I think that's kind of a shift in the way at least recently that I even look at I guess my responsibilities or the things that I have to do in life it's kind of even just looking at them and doing them and thinking about them, I guess, with a greater purpose in mind, kind of thinking, you know, God has given me this homework to do for a specific reason. Mm-hmm. Let me do it in the way that you would want me to, you know. Let me partake in doing it and accomplish it in the way that he would want me to, you know, not merely just because it's something I've been given and I have to do it, you know. Mm. I'm really trying to understand the essence behind the homework as well and kind of digging in more. Or even just any responsibilities. Mm. Yeah, when he's speaking about our needs too, it's, it, this seems to be kind of a, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's intending it be this but this really does speak in uh, opposition to those who have a like a an ascetic way of pursuing uh, a spiritual life which is like this this hermetic way of living like for instance the the stories of the desert monks who will go out and uh, estrange themselves themselves entirely from society and live in the desert in some cave so that they can spend a hundred percent of the time in prayer have no association with society and eat bugs you know that that's a super extreme example mm-hmm. but that that tendency to to obviously a very religious and I think to at the core of it actually a very self-centered and proud spiritually proud way of um, pursuing a spiritual life but even though they, they want to know God's will and to do his will you definitely say that they're actually missing it entirely because they're doing what they think is a, a good and spiritual um, style of life but it's not one necessarily given by God it's not God's purpose there may be um, unique cases but I, it's, it's, it's not something uh, that should stand as an example for God's people. That's the important part. So taking both these things in mind, our needs and our leisure, that's back into one of the earlier, or actually into the previous chapter on pure love, where even engaging in these things, we, we do so with a, a thanksgiving uh, 
for what God has blessed us with, and a thanks a thanksgiving even for things that are that may be troublesome and difficult for us in this life, because we realize that both our happiness and even our even our disappointment and disillusionment all are to be responded to in our hearts and our spirits with gratitude to the Lord for where he has us, knowing that we, we are where we are because he put us there because our lives don't belong to us nor is our happiness the end or the goal are we on uh, 21 yeah As precautions against wanderings, we must avoid close and intimate intercourse with those who are not pious, especially when we have been before led astray by their infectious maxims. They will open our wounds afresh. They have a secret correspondence deep in our souls. There is there a soft and insinuating counselor who is always ready to blind and deceive us. To summarize, be very careful who you spend time with. 22. Would you judge of a man, says the Holy Spirit, Proverbs 13, 20. Observe who are his companions. How can he who loves God and who loves nothing except in and for God Enjoy the intimate companionship of those who neither love nor know God and who look upon love to him as a weakness. Can a heart full of God and sensible of its own frailty ever rest and be at ease with those who have no feelings in common with it, but are ever seeking to rob it of its treasure? Their delights and the pleasures of which faith is the source are incompatible. I think these last two and the next few really um, uh, resonate with what the Lord spoke to you recently about being careful about who you, yeah. who you abide with and what you abide yeah. in. Very much. 23. I am well aware that we cannot, nay, that we ought not to break with those friends to whom we are bound by esteem of their natural amiability, by their services, by the tie of sincere friendship, or by the regard consequent upon mutual good offices. Friends whom we have treated with a certain familiarity and confidence would be wounded to the quick were we to separate from them entirely. We must gently and imperceptibly diminish our intercourse with them without abruptly declaring our alteration of sentiment. We may see them in private, distinguish them from our less intimate friends, and confide to them those matters in which our, their integrity and friendship enable them to give us good advice and to think with us, although our reasons for so thinking are more pure and elevated than theirs. In short, we may continue to serve them, and to manifest all the attentions of a cordial friendship without suffering our hearts to be embarrassed by them. So you begin to practice, or in the course of being wise in your relationships, you begin to practice a discernment mm -hmm. with those who maybe shouldn't have a certain place to speak in your life. So it would be unwise for you to cut off the relationship completely. Yeah, I like that. In most cases. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you begin to to really take into account where, what influence they have in your life, what, what place and priority they have in your heart. And this is a very funny thing, but I feel like someone who doesn't really I guess who hasn't really the Lord hasn't revealed why these things are important would mm -hmm. kind of look at this 
as kind of a selfish look on some on one's life. Mm-hmm. It's kind of just wanting to 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 keep a high mindedness or something yeah. you know, over others, but really it's looking beyond your own life and and what the impact has because each son is part of the body which you know each one is affected by whatever and like the way that we live and Mm -hmm. so looking at it in the perspective of how certain people will affect yourself and then that will also cause something within those that the Lord has given specifically um, in the body Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah no, that's something that was, uh, has recently been and is uh, very relevant for me too is mm-hmm. to, to really take into account the way I carry myself in relationships mm-hmm. as observed by even others around me, members of the community. That's mm-hmm. what you choose to do in your relationships with other people don't just affect you or even just the people you're interacting with, but those that observe on the outside too. Mm-hmm. That's the way that a that's 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 a way in which you develop a cultural mm-hmm. consciousness. Yeah, that's a good word. Mm-hmm. Is when you, you realize that your actions, particularly in your interactions with other people, have a cultural impact. Mm-hmm. Have a community influence. It kind of reminds me of what Emmanuel has said a lot is is you really can't have a meaningful relationship with someone without knowing who they are in the Lord uh, and their their purpose and obviously that's not all revealed to them or you at once but I think it's it's an alignment in their desire and kind of being in unity with one common purpose and goal Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is to fully lay bare ourselves and our desires. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of considering the people outside of this community and just friends and people you know in general. It's kind of just really asking the Lord and laying those friends before the Lord. You know, because those can even be in the way. And it's saying, you know, where should they be in my life? You know, where should I be in their life? You know, have you put this person in my life for a reason? You know, because a lot of time, I mean, he has. But it's it's just asking for revelation on what that is. Yeah, I think if you, I think especially for someone that you respect and that you hold in a certain place, it, it's definitely harder to do that and it's harder to kind of take what they have to say a certain way but I think this is that's what this is warning against yeah especially it's like you have to find people who share like a willingness to or for a true like, like God given relationship will be someone who's got the willingness to relate to you I mean relate to you on a certain level and to um, um, yeah just relate in a certain way that's that, that there's levels that some people cross some people aren't meant to cross there are life it's all about relationships some of which are some which stay at certain levels, and some which go deeper. I think in the course of one's spiritual development and the growth of one's spiritual life, that your relationships inevitably change. Because if those, if there are relationships that don't draw from that same source of life as you do spiritually, then you naturally begin to be less involved in that relationship mm-hmm. because what really constitutes a relationship especially a friendship is that you guys have a, a true friendship 
what constitutes a true friendship is that you guys share the same heart for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when that ceases to be the case, gradually, then that, that friendship becomes less of a a, a genuine thing. Mm -hmm. And more, it, that friendship becomes more of a, as the author puts it, a, a cordial friendship, mm -hmm. more of an association. So the point is not to be uh, drastic or um, dramatic about it, make these huge changes by completely cutting off the friendship, because that would, that's insensitive and not, not necessarily the, <laughs> the wisest way to do things. But at the same time, those things, I think, have a natural course of diminishing. And also, on the other side, you begin to find and build relationships with people you maybe not, you, you maybe never expected to, mm -hmm. because you, you do happen to find another who shares the same heart for the same thing. Yeah. All right, two more points here. 24. How perilous is our state without this precaution? If we do not from the first boldly adopt all measures to render our piety entirely free and independent of our unregenerate friends, it is threatened with a speedy downfall. If a man surrounded by such companions be of a yielding disposition and inflammable passions, it is certain that his friends, even the best intentioned ones, will lead him astray. They may be good, honest, faithful, and possessed of all those qualities which render friendship perfect in the eye of the world. But for him, they are infected, and their amiability only increases the danger. Those who have not this estimable, estimable character should be sacrificed at once. Blessed are we when a sacrifice that ought to cost us so little may avail to give us so precious a security for our eternal salvation. 25. Not only then should we be exceedingly careful whom we will see, but we must also reserve the necessary time that we may see God alone in prayer. Those who have stations of importance to fill have generally so many indispensable duties to perform that without the greatest care and the management of their time, none will be left to be alone with God. If they have ever so little inclination for dissipation, the hours that belong to God and their neighbor disappear altogether. We must be firm in observing our rules. This strictness seems excessive, but without it everything falls into confusion. We become dissipated, relaxed, and lose strength. We insensibly separate from God surrender ourselves to all our pleasures and only then begin to perceive that we have wandered. But it is almost hopeless to think of endeavoring to return. Prayer, prayer, this is our only safety. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Psalm 116, verse 20. And to be faithful in prayer, it is indispensable that we should dispose all the employments of the day with a regularity nothing can disturb. I really enjoyed this chapter. It gave some very good, as Isaac would say, practical ways of <laughs> uh, growing, well, I think more specifically maintaining our, our spiritual life mm -hmm. and as we were kind of talking about Isaac staying in that that mode or in that flow is it's a it does certainly have to do with the way that we spend our time a realistic approach to not 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 merely a a matter of knowing what not to do but knowing what to do and how to do it yeah. and who to do it with he was very 
um, intentional about pointing out the uh, importance of relationships in life too. I think he tied it up really well too with the last few uh, things that he said, just reminding everyone that there's an order in which the things of God operate and how they're without an order of things there really would be confusion you know mm -hmm. like there there's a standard that is um, applied to everything and especially um, in relationships I think but um, I don't know I just thought that was interesting where he 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 almost tries to calm the reader down saying that there's a purpose in uh taking such careful mm -hmm. regulation of uh, spiritual life. And I might add, uh, too, that for people that are, are conscious of a, a religious way of doing things being uh, something that inhibits our spiritual life, it may seem um, strange or uncomfortable or even wrong for us to build a, a regular way of doing things. A, uh, it, it would seem perhaps that there's a, a, a desire to develop a ritual almost of, of, a, of a way that we, you know, a more regular behavior, but that's obviously not the case. That's, that's kind of a short-sighted way of doing it. There is a very, very healthy, in fact, essential regularity to be had in our, our spiritual life. It is, it is a habit that should be built. There are good habits, and there are bad habits, and it's the good habits, these regular ways of of involving oneself in, in spiritual um, practices and exercises like meditation and reading things and as we do many times throughout the week spending coming together as God's people those are those are all things that should be regular have been ordained by God to his people to be things that we regularly do regularly practice of course, always as led and enlightened by his spirit. But again, the, the, the real concept here is, is not to walk about in a consciousness of what do I avoid that's wrong, but, but going further and, yeah, what can I regularly do in the management of my time as a son that brings me back to that source of life, to that source of wisdom that informs yeah. and shapes me into what I'm destined to be. All right. Genji, you want to pray for us? I do. Well, Lord, we, we do thank you for Lord, your continued revelation for, Lord, um, inspiring us, Lord, to be led by yourself, by your spirit, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the things that you have spoken in recent times in which, Lord, you are bringing to reality and, Lord, are teaching us in living ways. I pray for, indeed, a continuation, Lord, of you, yourself being revealed to, to us, Lord, and that we would um, take into account, Lord, these things that you have shown us, Lord, and have given us to, to live in. I do thank you, Father, for... Uh, just these relationships that you have blessed me with, Lord, and for the ability to to practice true brotherhood, Lord, 
in your ways, united by, Lord, your vision and the same desire, Lord, to want to be your sons. Just thank you for um, the blessing of this time. I pray that you would use it even to bless, Lord, more of your sons who happen to be listening in. And Lord, that these truths would forever be um, within, Lord, and would be taken and used as living as they are. So, Lord, I do thank you for the time again and pray um, for your blessing on the wisdom shared. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for your time. Could it be yours?